Welcome everybody to Radicalized, where truth survives and we always got your back. We are here in a new year and we're so happy that you're here with us 2023. Um, yeah, I'm here with Jim Stewart's in High Fidelity. You guys know the drill. We're an uh, investigative show about disinformation and we just keep soldiering on in, uh, in this uh, very incredible um, time that we're living in. And uh, we have an incredible guest as our first guest of the new year here, Giles, my longtime friend, a true, true warrior in understanding um, uh, Russia's play. And he has a new book, Russia's War on Everybody. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So pretty damn cool. How are you guys doing? I'm good. I, I, I feel saner after reading Pierre's book real fast. <laughs> yeah, I, man. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, it, it's really important to have voices like that that are, are willing to, you know, tell the truth. And I'm honored he's on the show. Oh, we have so much good stuff for you guys. Oh, my gosh. We're Let's just jump in so we can get to that interview. Front loaded. Now, forgive me in advance if I get a little bit misted, misted up, a little misty eyed. Um, our very good friend Zarina Zabriskie wrote by far the most incredible report from the war in Ukraine. I want everybody to stop whatever they're doing uh, and read this report, Ukrainian Dreams, the Dark Roots of Putin's Nightmare War. Zarina has such a poetic way of expressing herself. So it's not only that the words are so beautiful, but it's that she spent her summers in Odessa, blissful summers in her youth, and then these dark winters in St. Petersburg. And she has more, you know, of an ability to frame what's actually happening than I think, uh, you know, we've talked to a lot of amazing people, but Serena has a very special way of doing it. Um, and I just want everybody to read it because uh, it's inspiring, it's honest, and she really, really understands the number that Putin has played on um, his people and the world. And we talk about it later about, you know, tube feeding propaganda, brainwashing sludge right into the brains of uh, the citizens uh, in Russia. And Jim has been writing about the digital poison that's being tube fed into people's brains here in America. So I was very inspired and I was very, very, very inspired um, to write another piece, which we'll talk about in a minute. But let's get on to the second item right here. Uh, the Kremlin School of Bloggers. I thought it was really important to revisit my first thread that I ever did with, on Keir Giles, my war fighting thread. He wrote a 2016 NATO report titled The Handbook of Russian Information Warfare. It came out November of 2016. Clearly, we've known about their techniques for a long time. But Kier was the first person to take all the academic papers and put it into something that was very, very comprehensive and very accessible. And uh, that thread of mine has probably been read by a half million people. But I want to bring it to your attention because the information's always been there. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I, uh, I mean, Zarina, first of all, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, is, Zarina's is awesome. That, uh, yeah, and um, important. You know, Kier, uh, as we will see, um, also brilliant. Just and, so and important. I would just like to point. I, I would like to point out to to our uh, to our viewers, to our audience that uh, you can still download yeah. the handbook of Russian information. It's, it's right there on the web, folks. Go out there and grab yourself a copy. Please little, read it. Yeah, a little light reading for when you're Please on Please read it. WC. Yeah. Look, look, this information has been out there for decades. They, yeah. we, we have KGB defectors coming over to the United States four decades ago telling us all about the actual subversion campaign that yeah. the Russians were waging on the West. And and it, it never stopped. No. That's where it comes from. That's what we're seeing right now. So my my goal for twenty twenty three is I is just to keep doing the work and I know I take the action, I can't predict the results, but I do hope that the fact that I'm getting more phone calls in my personal life from people who are starting to see that this 
Russia thing is not a hoax. I'm hoping that we are going to be able to elevate and amplify that message because we need more people to understand that as Kier will tell us, there are no rear areas in this type of information warfare. If, if you see it, and I see it, and Jim sees it, and Kier sees it, a lot of our audience sees it, obviously Wesley Clark sees it, Jack Bryan sees it, all these people see it, where the hell are our intelligence agencies? Well, why, why are, they see it. They're just not willing to tell the American people about it. And, and the urgency that we are going to be discussing with Kier is that it needs to happen at the highest levels. Uh, leaders across the world and in the Western world need to tell their people that this is happening because um, there, there's no one who's not being impacted by it, which we will also discuss with Kier. So the next item was inspired by Zarina's reporting. Um, because it occurred to me in the Tech Bro Soldiers General Spy article that I just wrote, it occurred to me that a KGB spy running a country is not good for the world, should have never been allowed to happen. And the fact that he's allied with a disgraced American general, a psycho tech bro or few, and mercenaries is not good. And I mean, it's why can't we see that these are criminals that need to be whisked off to The Hague for, you know, a global tribunal and uh, the end of their crimes? Why not? Y yes, they are criminals, but they are more than just criminals. Every individual you name in that headline has an overdeveloped sense of ego of will to power they're they're narcissists they're sociopaths and they're willing to do anything to get and maintain control and, and i would i would argue that this is a flaw in our system and always has been uh we've just been good at curtailing the the uh when were we good at curtailing it yeah uh, you know I, I, I'm going to disagree with you there. It's just gotten, it's gotten worse and we worse. We have term limits, bro. They, they, we, they weaponized, uh, they, they've weaponized our own media, our own communication systems against yeah. us. Yeah. And the part of the problem is that, that a lot of what they're doing is not illegal. It's not criminal, right? It's not, True. there, there is no fucking law that says you can't be a Russian propagandist, unfortunately. There so, is, but there is yeah. enough criminal behavior and one thing that- Of course, the, don't yeah. get me wrong. These right. are people are not only criminals, but, you know, crime against humanity yes. level. Yes, yes. You know, absolutely, they've caused untold death, untold yeah. just, just brainwashing and, and changing people's minds. They're absolutely horrific criminals, but- the the flaw that they're that they're exploiting is the you know free speech in america which was never intended to mean that you can say anything the fuck you want about anyone you want yeah, or <laughs> that that a foreign enemy state can exploit it to destroy our country that's the other yeah. issue and again um two two quick things on that note as fred as as craig unger has told us before it's the things that are legal that are really uh, harming America. So that is obviously the structural reform that we talked about with Nancy McLean that needs to happen. And you know, the other point that we will talk about uh, in the interview with Kier mm -hmm. is that so many of these people that are that are harming our world and committing crimes against humanity, this cabal, they came together over their early criminal behaviors. So that is gonna be something we're gonna be analyzing in 2023. Yes, high five. I would just like to point out that everything we're talking about with the co-option of media to the leading to deaths from anti-vax propaganda, all of these things require money. And my whole point this entire damn time has been that there's some serious money laundering going on. Yes. If we stop that, I think we've stopped a large part of the problem. Okay, well, uh, well I'm going to point out that Tier use, uses, as I do, the MICE acronym. Yeah. Right? So 
you know, yes, the money is very important. It's the first letter, <laughs> you know, money, ideology, compromising information and ego. We were just talking about ego, like just taking the money out of it, sadly, is not going to fix the problem because you've still got people who are brainwashed. You've still got an entire information ecosystem that is there to make them act against their own self-interests, which is ultimately what these things are about. But it will help. So it will it well, it'll, it'll, yeah. it'll certainly it'll, help. <laughs> Absolutely. It's also where, where the actual crimes can be. Mm -hmm. You can't, you're not allowed in America to be a foreign, uh, you know, in the employee, employee of a foreign nation state without registering, mm -hmm. without telling us exactly what you're doing. And, you know, so there's all kinds of, of crimes being committed in the, in the money space. Just saying it's, it's not going to by itself. True. But those are provable crimes that can be traced to no one's Actually, arguing, bro. You got it. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just so, want uh, some people in the cages. Uh, we we oh, know you do. We know you do. We have goals for 2023. Um, yeah. So I do want to say before we move on that I want to give a shout out to the former Prime Minister of Canada, A. Kim Campbell, who retweeted that article of mine. And that's a big deal to me because, as you know, Twitter is broken, but we are still uh, finding ourselves and finding our allies and if A. Kim Campbell thinks that these guys should be, uh, you know, uh, visiting The Hague, then there may be some validity there. And the other thing I wanted to point out is I just want to give a quick shout out to our friend Brent Allpress. He has been beside us in this fight. He's been doing incredible work um, of his own. Uh, we continue to have a large scale subversion operation um, trying to discredit the work that uh, people like us do. And Brent is always there with clear eyed, you know, a clear eyed lens, uh, standing up for uh, people who do this kind of work. And I just want to thank him from the bottom of my heart. And Jim, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah I do. And, uh, you know, uh, we won't get into details, but um, uh, yeah, Brent, Brent is, a, is the rare person who actually understands the entire scope of it and can see right through the techniques that um, these bad actors use and the reasons for them. And his techniques are very simple. Tell the goddamn truth right to their face and, and explain to them to their face exactly what they're doing. This is the technique you're using right now. This is why you're doing it. And here's the information you don't want people to see. Yeah. Absolutely um, genius. And, and there's incredible. a reason why he got, what was it called? The Golden the, Balls the, Award? The, bra the Brass Bullocks <laughs> Award. The first the annual Brass Bullocks <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna win the brass bullocks award again. I think this he's year. at the golden balls now. <laughs> yes. He started with brass bullocks and now he's at golden balls. All right. And speaking of but, golden balls, but I can't balls, make jokes. Okay. I speaking see how you of guys golden are. balls, we're gonna pass the baton to Hi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Now I have golden balls and a baton. Great. Okay. Word anyway, phrase of the week. Word phrase of the week this week. I want to make sure I don't mess this up. This is a rough one. Uh, this is Zomboy Ashchik. Yes. Because, well hey, if we're, we're going to study Russia, we got to know the Russian, right? And Zomboy Ashchik is what they call the television. It's the zombifying box, the zombie box. Um, and, you know, the state propaganda that is fed to Russia through their televisions. Um, and I haven't seen this movie. I don't, I haven't translated this movie, but I really like the image that a Russian filmmaker used here. That is great <laughs> to me. Um, anyway. so, so just to go, just to back up a bit, uh, that page screenshot that we just saw was from, uh, uh, Kier's new book, the, you know, Russia's war on everybody. And um, it also matches with what uh, Zarina was talking about, how that, you know, uh, sludge, that brainwashing propaganda sludge is put through to people's minds on the tube. That's going to be another theme of 2023 as we match the Russian propagandists on TV with, with what we're seeing here. And I will say this probably every other episode. I do believe my superhero power is that I have not had a television since 2006. Um, I, it helps. I it argue, helps me. 
I would argue that Zomboyashchik, uh, at least here in the United States, could also be applied to computers, telephones, tablets, uh, because that's how the disinformation is being fed to us. Absolutely. But, but I will say that in homes that have that on the TV on in the background, and I know this because when I enter those homes, my post-traumatic news syndrome is immediately triggered again. Um, it's just, it becomes like this sort of, you know, big brother background noise. So even if you're not seeking it out, like you might on, you know, depending on what you're on with your tablet or whatever algorithm you enter, just having that constant, particularly if it's tuned into one of the American propaganda channels, is really um, dangerous and needs to be uh, addressed. Look, there's Russian state media. There is not official American state media, but there is Russian state media in America. Yeah. Let's be oh, very yeah. fucking clear. Yeah, With right. Newsmax, Fox, yeah. OAN, all these yeah. guys literal, oh, literal God. Kremlin propaganda channels being pumped into American homes. It's, yeah. an, it's a whole segment of our, our public cable television networks that are devoted to Russian state media. Yeah. Now, that is the fundamental problem, uh, in my view, uh, in, with American uh, information systems and why we are so vulnerable to warfare. Because we do not have any defense against Fox News pushing great replacement theory and pro-Putin propaganda and anti-vax and every fucking terrible, harmful propaganda idea you can think of going straight into the minds, especially of our, you know, boomer Americans. And yeah. I'm sorry that word, you can yeah. get the QAnon channel on Roku now. Goddamn yeah. right. You can. One of my... Um, awesome. That's one just of, great. Yeah. One of the members of my Substack community, uh, you know, zip me a message where he put RT Witter. So instead of Twitter, it was capital RT Witter. So I would include Twitter as that RT propaganda, you know, uh, network that uh, you can do. So yeah, and, and by the way, and I know Heidi, you're still on there. Yeah. Um, and you're 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 there to hold your ground and all of that good stuff. <sighs> Everybody else, if you do not evacuate, if you do not have a a super good reason to be on Twitter. Yeah. Like if you're not actively, you know, fighting, you're just Chum. You're just chum. I know. I, I, so even, I, I'm just telling people, to like, I go to Mastodon. Even, I'm serious. Like, yeah, I, no, I, no, I, know. I, I now have like, what, 7% of the followers that I did on Twitter. But it's just, there's like conversations and I'm getting, you know, there's just as much engagement and, and all of that. It's just without the interference. Toxic. And, then, yeah. and it's not controlled by a central figure. Yeah, named Elon Musk, who is a literal pro-Putin neo-Nazi 4chan troll. It's Period. so bad, Jim. It is so bad. I am there because I am an investigative reporter. I remove myself. I'm one, you know, one fewer investigative reporter, but it is so bad. It is so toxic. I have to literally put my armor on before I go near it. And even if I do, the despair that they're selling can set in and I block everybody as you know. And so I'm so happy when I find the timeline cleanses and my friends and you know, people who've always been on there as comedians and just the people, you know, who have taught me so so much. But I find myself uh going to Mastodon uh in equal parts now to see what the real you know news is without that filter so uh your point is well taken it's it's speaking, just a terrible war speaking of real news let's do why it matters why does it matter why does it matter why high fidelity first story this week Tate. Teal Tech Terror. Mm. Uh, yes. So uh, this was a story out of Yorkshire. Um, and I do love me some Yorkshire. Yorkshire bylines. Andrew Tate platformed by government-favored service provider. And who's that image they choose? 
none mm -hmm. other than our uh, good yeah, friend, Mr. Peter, yeah, good friend, Mr. Peter good Thiel. Friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, listen, uh, and, and this this article jumps through some hoops, but basically, you know, Palantir is working for the NHS for the UK government. Um, Andrew Tate, who is a misogynist influencer, was recently arrested for uh, sex trafficking accusations. Um, remember that Andrew Tate would have completely disappeared from reality. Uh, he was deplatformed on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. He was his voice was silenced. The world had said we do not want that individual uh, to be allowed to spread his poison. So, of course, Peter Thiel has to give him a platform on Rumble, mm -hmm. and that's how Andrew Tate stayed alive until today's current debacle. All right. Yeah, you got you got huge on Rumble, and I've written about this. Rumble is 100% Kremlin propaganda. The whole thing. Just go to the fucking front page. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, like far left pro-Putin, far right pro-Putin. It doesn't fucking matter. As long as it's pro-Putin or like Andrew, Andrew Tate, just extremely toxic to American audiences, that's all good on Rumble. So it, uh, I, it is astonishing. There is no truth whatsoever other than the occasional dog picture on fucking Rumble. And I don't even know if I believe those. So. There it is. There it is. All right. Next story this is. week. Next story this week. Meta's money masks malice. <laughs> say that five times fast, right? <laughs> uh, but but what I, this I like is about, alliteration. I do, I do, I do. Um, Meta settled their Cambridge Analytica scandal case for $725 million. All right. Listen, uh, we know that Palantir was helping Cambridge Analytica scrape data from Facebook. We know that that data was used to target Americans. We know that that data is being used to run operations against Americans. $725 million to Meta is... A moderately bad day at the office. It's not mm. a penalty. So I don't know what it's going to take uh, for people to understand the severity of the issue that was caused. High level and incarcerations. It's going to it, take it, high it, level I mean, They not only scrape the data, right? The reason why Facebook got so enormous during that whole period was that it was just a, a massive target and a massive vacuum suction into Facebook in order to, um, you know, get involved in hate, right? For start in 2015, 2016, the thing just blew up and it blew yeah. up with hate. Yeah. Uh, like I was on Facebook until 2016, 2017. I couldn't fucking take it anymore. Yeah. And I'm tough. I don't, you know, it was just like horrible. And that yeah. was not, not just scraped by by Cambridge Analytica. That was the reason, right? Because they were targeting these specific groups and they were inflaming people's um, anger. And as we know, the goddamn algorithm of Facebook was to incite you to be angry because you've got more engagement from being angry and Cambridge Analytica told you. So just like Hi-Fi said, before Zuckerberg got sort of caught with his pants down, Meta was a trillion dollar company. So $725 million is less than 0.1% of the goddamn value of that company. And it means zero. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I would like to, to just, if our viewers or if our audience has not seen this, uh, Emma Bryant's propaganda machine dot tech. Um, you, you can point to these countries and, and see the effect. Uh, for instance, the 2020 riots in Delhi. Uh, I've spoken to people who live in India, reporters who are there. And I asked them, I said, what was Facebook like just before the riots? Every single one of them has given me the same answer. It was awful. It was full of hate. It was horrid. Yeah, I mean, so... Here's the thing. I just revisited the um, 
Channel 4 undercover video that they did with Cambridge Analytica execs. And do you remember them bragging about how you could enter into the information ecosystem anonymously and you could just go ahead and do these like, you know, campaigns, you know, Hillary Clinton, lock her up, showing the handcuffs. And, you know, they were bragging about this. And we know that entire countries literally like, you know, I believe it was Kenya had to redo their elections because they figured out that what was happening on Facebook was impacting uh, people's mm. brains, hacking their brains and making them vote a different way. And, you know, here we are in America, patiently waiting for high level arrests. We know who funded it. We know who was behind it. We know how it was weaponized. We know that this type of stuff is still harming people. And yet all these guys who put this together are still uh, free to com commit more crimes against humanity. You know, yeah, we'll, that, be, we'll, we'll be talking about that in Hellscape. Great. I can't wait. Okay. What else you got for us, Hi-Fi? Final story this week, The Dirty Dozen. And when I say The Dirty Dozen, no, I am not referring to the quintessential war movie with Lee Marvin. No, I'm actually referring to 12 companies who have failed to exit Russia after 300 some days of war. Uh, these companies include such uh, you know, luminaries as Unilever, British Petroleum, of course, Chevron. Uh, one of my favorites, Johnson & Johnson, who just goes where the evil and the money lead, and uh, General Electric. Look, yeah. Russia is at war with the world. Why are you still doing business with them? What's it going yeah. to take? I got the answer to that. It was my shameful opportunist, uh, why fascism backs big business post, because Jason Stanley explained to us that fascism works because big business backs these authoritarians when they promise, oh, you know, better taxation, you know, uh, fewer regulations, we'll deal with that labor problem. And nobody has explained to them yet that they're not going to like fascism either when the leader of the authoritarian country decides that they want your business, they will take it, as we have seen over and over I mean, again. Look, 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 just look. Uh, leading up to World War II, you got Henry Ford out there, who is literally, a, you know, a Nazi, um, frankly, and um, you know, lots and lots of other big business, including uh, the forerunners of the Bush family, and lots of other, uh, you know, um, uh, American business people were pro-Nazi. Um, you know, we forget. Right. Um, and it's it's and it's not, you know, necessarily because the company wanted to be Nazis. It's just yeah. that companies are not people, despite what fucking Mitt right. Romney says. Companies right. are there to make profit. And right. if there's nothing illegal about doing business in Russia, um, they're going to fucking do it. You know, I hosted a business series uh, up until a decade ago, and I had. A, you know, had a platform where a lot of CEOs could air their grievances on why they would, you know, leave California, move to Texas, or why they would stay in California and, and not move to a place like Texas. And I felt so betrayed in 2016 when they all got in line to kiss the ring. I had like the cell phone numbers of a lot of CEOs because I, you know, was a reporter that that was my beat. And I felt so betrayed and I really didn't fully understand it until Jason Stanley explained it to us. And, and well, I think I mean, that, I, I think that we, the people who are what allows these places to stay in business are the ones that could actually influence them the most by not spending our money at corporations or companies that backed fascism. We yeah. don't have to. I mean, the, the the best example of this is fucking Twitter, as we were just des describing. That that is a massive, used to be public business, um, that literally got co opted and is now Kremlin propaganda. What did Hi Fi say? A forty four billion dollar psyops cannon. Yeah, right. You well, know, that's a good segue to hellscape. Jim Stewartson's hellscape. Oh, fuck. All right. Um, well, the last week, uh, it's not, 
it's tough to pick and choose for Hellscape um, because um, 2023 started off um, with the second insurrection. Um, and so I want to talk about January 6th, 2023. Why do I say it was a second insurrection? Um, and why do I say it was worse than the first one? Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is the um, insane shit show we saw in the House of Representatives culminating on Kevin McCarthy, traitor to the United States of America and an amoral sociopath, was elected Speaker of the House. Um, if you will stand by, let me pull up my article. Um, so I'm calling it the second insurrection um, here. Look, there were 15 rounds of chaos, and we gave a platform and a microphone on national television for a week to people who literally, not not metaphorically, literally planned the insurrection, right? And not only did they <laughs> plan the insurrection and not get um, charged, indicted, and arrested for it, they were elected to Congress. So we've got Matt Gates and Lauren Bober and Andy Biggs and people who literally planned 1-6. We've also got, uh, as we discussed before, Peter Thiel's chaos agent, Chuck Johnson, running around with Matt Gates and orchestrating this whole nightmare. Um, it's all playing out on national television and no one is seeing what's really happening here, which is that this is a chaos operation intentionally um, inflicted on the United States by people who want to subvert democracy. It's really that simple. Um, but let, let's be clear for a second about what put Kevin McCarthy in place. And there were there were some, you know, liberals out there and, and others who, who sort of celebrated the fact that, you know, oh we you know, our democracy still works and we, you know, we got the the not, you know, we didn't get Andy Biggs or Matt Gates as speaker or Jim Jordan, who they were pushing, right? Um, I'm sorry, but the only reason why Kevin McCarthy got uh, the votes is because he guaranteed literal traitors to the United States that he's going to hold the country hostage over a technical debt ceiling raise uh, in order to um, destroy. Social Security and Medicare. Um, the age old bullshit about Social Security not being funded and all of these things. Um, it's there to to take away the safety net, to make Americans uh, angry with their own government so that people like Vladimir Putin can uh, come in destroy it and uh if if not take it over influence it at the very highest level see donald trump um but another thing happened on january 6 uh 2023 um which hit me pretty hard i'm not going to i'm not going to lie about that this motherfucker general mike flynn worst traitor in history of the United States of America was allowed back on Twitter to psyop the American public on the two year anniversary of 1 6. That was not a coincidence. That was Elon Musk approving, approving of the insurrection, approving of Mike Flynn's behavior. That's why he let him in, uh, on that date, is because he was sending a signal like he has been sending for the entire last year to neo-Nazis, to literal Nazis, to anyone that he can think of that will 
be harmful to the United States. Andrew Anglin, Andrew Tate, all of these monsters. That's who he's choosing to platform. That's who he's putting on, on Twitter. And that's why the worst trader in American history was put on the platform on 1-6. Um, what's the first thing he does? The first thing Mike Flynn does is promote his, his how to psyop book. Literally a book that is half Kremlin propaganda and half instruction manual on how to harm and eventually kill your neighbor. It literally has a page called how to make people kill people. That's what Elon Musk is doing, and that's why Mike Flynn thanked him uh, from the bottom of his heart for protecting free speech. Um, Stephanie Rule is a fine anchor, and I'm not here to slam Stephanie Rule. I am here to slam whatever the decision process was that put this. QAnon cult member on television as if she was a politician. If you're going to put Lauren Boebert on the air, you need to ask her why she's in QAnon, why she is, uh, hangs out with neo-Nazis all the time. That's what you ask her, not about her vote and, and you know, what are the politics of this situation. Fuck that. That is a traitor. You treat her like one, or you do not platform her. What you're doing is moving the Overton window, which is the acceptable range of discourse from far right to far left to Nazis. You're moving it to her because you're validating her. This is the fundamental problem we have. It's, it's why the Nazis nearly uh, were able to... Um, uh, overthrow the U.S. government in World War II is because we had people like Father Coughlin. We had the New York Times who was who was sympathizing with uh, Hitler and and the Nazis. Um, you have we have to get our own shit together, or we're going to keep sliding the Overton window all the way off the edge of democracy. I want to end on on this guy, um, John Raggi, um, uh is somebody that Rachel Maddow highlights in her podcast Ultra, which if you have not heard, please for God's sake, it's so critical to hear because we're not. It, this is not history rhyming; it's history plagiarizing itself. John Raggi was a, a a lawyer um, at the Justice Department who was handed the insurrection case of 28 seditionists who were plotting to overthrow the American government. And a conspiracy, and I'm not going to make it any less than that, of Americans um, not only um, uh, shut down the case against these Nazis, but minimized and and um, harmed this man who was trying to get information to the public that there were Nazi sympathizers in Congress. So for 15 years, they managed to suppress it until he finally got it out in 1961, by which time no one gave a shit. But he did get it out, and he showed us exactly how dozens of congressmen and women were literally using their offices to put Hitler speeches into envelopes and on the American dime, send them out to voters. We're seeing this all over again. We need John Rocky. We need Someone like this who is willing to put themselves out there, who's willing to take the personal risk to tell the truth about how this is working, 
why is our Congress half full of Putin sympathizers? Why is that? We need to know and we need heroes like Raggi. My, my only hope remaining in this world, and it sucks, is Jack Smith. Is Jack Smith John Raggi? Or is Jack Smith Robert Mueller? God help us if it's the latter. That's my escape. And we are so excited to bring in uh, my good friend and a true, true warrior in this fight, Keir Giles, author of uh, his latest book is called Russia's War on Everybody. We ask all of our viewers to please support his book. Please buy his work. You will learn so much. Um, but uh, he has been doing this work because he doesn't like what Russia is doing to the world. So let's bring Keir in. All right, Kira, it is so great to see you. Now, last time I saw you, you looked a little bit like ZZ Top. What was going on there? I think you caught me in the middle of a Tolstoy challenge where I'd started growing out a bit of a COVID beard and everybody started telling me that I looked like a Russian philosopher like Dugin in Moscow or one of the older guys, Marx, Engels and so on. And of course, he gave me a bit more authority as a Russian commentator. But one of our <laughs> diplomats then came out and said, nobody goes the full Tolstoy. And I couldn't turn down a challenge like that. So eventually grew it out way below where you can see in this shot and then said challenge met took it off for charity raised a couple of thousand pounds for one of our servicemen's charity it's over here so job done and it's it's back to normal for now uh, well you look fabulous i'm so grateful that you're taking the time with us today and we're very very excited to i want to see the full Dugan beer <laughs> you'll, you'll get to <laughs> So uh, your new book, Russia's War on Everybody, we're going to get to that. But you and I met um, because one of my Twitter followers said uh, I needed to read uh, this NATO handbook on Russian information warfare. And it was uh, something written in 2016. And I was on the Metro and I pulled an all nighter, like threading the uh, latest Mueller indictments. And as I started reading it, I just was like, oh, my God, this was already known in 2016. And I began threading it immediately. And then you and I uh, met each other and have been, um, you know, swapping information ever since. Can you just kind of take us back to 2016 and what prompted that report and tell our viewers some of the salient highlights from that? Well, that's quite a big question. But yes, first of all, where it came from. Um, 2016, of course, was not the start of discovering all of this uh, because we knew a lot of this a long time before. And what I really wow. wanted to do with that NATO handbook was pull together a lot of this knowledge into one place and make it accessible because it had been scattered throughout scientific papers and academic journals and very specialized stuff for Russia watchers. And this, I thought, was a good way of bringing together all of those sources, all of that information, and putting it out somewhere uh, that although it was supposedly designed for NATO people who were coming fresh to the Russian disinformation problem, would actually be available for, for everybody worldwide. And that's exactly how you picked it up. So it looked at all of the different things that Russia itself had said about information as a weapon, as a means of Russia getting its way in confrontations with other countries at lots of different levels of ambition. And I think this is one of the things that uh, that you picked up on specifically when you read it back in 2016, that when people are thinking about the reasons why Russia carries out information campaigns, information attacks against its adversaries, they often think that there has to be some purpose, some strategic goal, some actual objective that they're trying to reach by doing so. But that's not always the case because you have different levels of ambition that they're trying to achieve. There's strategic regime change, depriving a country of its sovereignty by, by changing its government down through creating a permissive environment for Russia worldwide, trying to set the conditions for them to do something that we really don't want them to or escape the consequences afterwards. But then at the very bottom level, there's just causing damage and harm and mayhem for the sake of it. And that's a point that I think often a lot of people actually miss. The fact that in this zero sum view of security that Russia has, anything that they do to harm adversaries, damage to their societies or the political systems or faith in institutions or all of those things that Russia attacks, any of those things 
by weakening the adversary by comparison, make Russia stronger. And that's why you have these campaigns that seemingly have no purpose other than pure malice. And a classic example, of course, is funding and coordinating anti-vaccination movements worldwide mm -hmm before we were hit right. by a global pandemic because right. it suited Russia for other countries to be having public health crises. And then of course, in the coronavirus pandemic, just stepping up those efforts and pushing more and more anti-vaccination propaganda, which just indicates the, the malicious intent behind this and also the purposelessness of, of it other than just to cause harm. Right, and what is, what is your gift as being somebody who's read many, many uh, papers and all of your books, your gift is in relaying things in an, uh, uh, it, it's smart, but it's not in that academic way where people who are just like a, a layman would get caught in the weeds. You have an ability to cut right to the point. And that is why I believe your work is so valuable. And again, reading your, doing the type of work that we do and the type of work I've done for the last six years, and then reading your words is just such an affirmation. It's such a, this, this is our war. And our job is to get it out to more people. And please uh, let our viewers know about your latest book and some of the you know, key takeaways. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. And yes, I do try to keep it simple. I'm not an academic. And sometimes the way of getting a point across uh, in a way that's understandable is just bringing it down to my own moronic level so it's clear enough. And then <laughs> <laughs> the serious point of that is some of the some of the problems that we're confronting coming from Russia are at their root very, very simple and straightforward. And sometimes when you try to overcomplicate these things, it makes it more difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. And you just need to come back to that basic root of the problem that the people who are running the show in Moscow don't like us. They don't want to be like us and they want to harm us, whether or not it actually has a purpose. And as soon as you, you view all of these actions through that basic prism, then again, everything becomes a great deal more straightforward. But the current book that's out is, uh, is a follow up actually to a, a different book than the one you mentioned. Back in 2019, I wrote a book called Moscow Rules, What Drives Russia to Confront the West? Because right. it was a question that kept being asked of us, why exactly is Russia so hostile to the West? Why do they want to attack us, not just in the present day, but going back through centuries? What is it that makes them dislike and hate us so much? So it was a look back through Russian history to look at all these consistent patterns that make Russia behave like this and the ways in which they actually carry out that behavior, how they work on these instincts that they have to, to attack and to, uh, to be hostile to the West. So that looked at the why Russia does this. And this new book that's coming out in the US at the end of January is about the how. It's called Russia's War on Everybody. And it looks at all of the different ways in which Russia prosecutes these campaigns to damage the West. All of the ones except what we see in Ukraine at the moment, because Ukraine with this open military conflict is the one thing that Russia is trying to avoid when it deals with the West as a whole, because it knows that if it is in open warfare, the result is a foregone conclusion and it will be disastrous for Russia. But in every single other possible domain of waging war, Russia has already been convinced for a long time that it is in a state of conflict with the West and it's behaving accordingly. So all of the different levers of power that it can use to attack us, it has been using. And that's the part which I think has not been sufficiently recognized even after this war on Ukraine started. Whether it's economic or cyber or disinformation warfare or some of those campaigns of subversion and pu punishing public health that we talked about just a few minutes ago, it's all been ongoing. And the point of this latest book, the reason why I called it Russia's War on Everybody, is it affects everybody. It's not just the politicians and the diplomats and the generals that need to be concerned about this because it's ordinary people around the world that feel the effects. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We, you're the first person who taught me in this type of uh, active measures, information warfare, there are no rear areas. It is cheap. It's cheap to target people. We get targeted by subversion operations. And we have a real problem in America where there is a, an a ingrained denial 
about Russia's role. And I've done voluminous reporting on this. I I showed the Ianov indictment that they're paying, you know, political groups on the left and the right to disrupt our communities and to cause chaos. How do we reach our uh, citizens here in America and abroad and let them know that this Russian active measures, this information warfare is real and it is affecting everybody? Well, that phrase that you just used, no rear areas, that actually comes from a quote that I pulled from Russia's chief of general staff, Ileri Gerasimov, talking wow. about the way... Gerasimov, doctor. Yes, wow. indeed. Wow. Well, let's not go down that rabbit hole. But yes, it is the guy who got the doctrine named after him, uh, much to everybody's dismay. He's, yeah. He was talking about the way in which there's no front line and there's no rear areas. He was talking about the effects that Russia can now deliver, being able to reach across the whole of an adversary's territory. And that means, of course, directly that the United States is not insulated by distance from how Russia can reach out and do it harm. And the part, second part of your question, how exactly do we get this to people's attention? Well, the book is part of the effort to do that. Okay. But of course, I'm only one voice and uh, there have been plenty of years before where nobody's actually listened to what I said. What we really need is key leader engagement in far more countries than we've seen so far. Because okay. one of the consistent patterns that we've seen is as soon as the leadership of a country admits publicly that they are under attack by Russia, that triggers a whole lot of other processes which make defending against Russia a great deal easier because it gets over that initial mindset of denial of it's not happening here. Okay. And it government and media and institutions and businesses and ordinary people to actually take those essential steps to protect themselves and to build up that societal resilience, which is the biggest tool in protecting yourself against Russia. So the first step anywhere is just admitting and recognizing the problem. Thank you. So you, you, you say that you know, the media needs to admit that we are under attack. However, it seems to me that the forces of Russia have infiltrated our media, not only creating disinformation channels as, as legitimate news, which they are not, but also they have infiltrated the legitimate media landscape such that they are altering the reporting that is fed to countries. How do you counteract that? That depends very much on national context. And in the case of the United States, it's a very, very specific problem where some of the, the prime time broadcasters are actually pushing the Russian messages, even though, as you say, they are in legitimate media. Right. Now, other countries around the world are better equipped societally and constitutionally to deal with that kind of challenge because they can recognize the threat from hostile foreign influence and can take steps to mitigate the damage. If there's disinformation being pumped into people's living rooms through propaganda channels, then they have the powers to actually um, step in and shut that down. But it does vary hugely across the world. Now, uh, here in the UK, we have one of the, the bigger problems because there is not the legislation to protect uh, society against foreign agents, against agents working on a foreign against foreign of foreign power. That's actually perfectly legal, which our parliamentarians over here discovered a couple of years ago when they dug deep into patterns of subversion in the UK and why they were not being stopped and realized to their surprise that everything that was happening was actually perfectly legal up to and including even conducting espionage on behalf of foreign powers against the UK, which is completely legal unless and until you do it successfully. And that's just one of the examples of the gaps in the legislation that really need to be addressed. Now, there are other countries around the world that are doing it very much more effectively. If you take, for example, Australia, their uh, foreign interference task force and has been resourced and provided with appropriate legislation and powers to look not just at media, but actually across the board, all of the different areas in which hostile powers seek to influence Australian politics and society and democracy are actually within the remit of this foreign interference scheme. And that is absolutely essential because of the diverse way in, in which all of these different programs are undertaken against our societies. Now, in the case of Australia, of course, their primary problem is China. But the point is, if you make your resist, yourself resilient against these programs, that's actually a universal 
tool. It's a universal defense against any foreign power that might actually want to reach into your society in the same way. So it works just as well for Russia. Wow. Jim. I, um, the, the, the thing that, that keeps striking me is that uh, the R Russians have been, the Russian government, and let's make sure we distinguish between the government and the people, Sure. Um, have been ha, has been doing this for many decades, right? Um, the it, Vladimir Putin came from the KGB, right? And the KGB has been was uh, was doing these subversion activities, you know, way back into the into the twentieth century. Um, and really, it seems to me, and I want to hear your thoughts about this. Um, I've read some. Some of your thoughts in your book, um, Vladimir Putin appears to be trying to reinstitute the Soviet Union through his his Eurasian um, activities, etc. I just wanted to get uh, get your thoughts on on what seems to be going back to the USSR and a lot of the the not only the the sort of ideology but the behavior um, of the of the Soviet Union. Yeah, there are a couple of important points there. Um, just before we come on to the USSR, that idea that all of these um, techniques and all of these methods that Russia is using against the West are new and have come out of nowhere is, is surprisingly prevalent. People think this is a new issue instead of realizing that the reason why it was not um, quite so highlighted in previous years was was twofold. First of all, a lack of attention paid to it in the West because it wasn't so much of a problem. And second, um, Russia not putting so many resources into it as they had previously. So the intent in Moscow has always been there. It's the capabilities that have varied and with them, the amount of foreign attention that it gets. And so we shouldn't overlook the fact that these everything that Russia is doing has deep roots in Russian tradition, going back not just to the Soviet Union, but even into Tsarist time. Some of the approaches are actually recognizable from what Tsarist Russia did to liberal democracies in the 19th century. Right. Which brings me on to that second point about Putin trying to resurrect the USSR. In a way, that's not really true, because look at what Putin is saying and why he's launched this war on Ukraine. He doesn't want to recreate the USSR. He says the USSR was actually to blame for some of the anomalous situations, he says, uh, are around Russia's periphery at the moment. To blame for setting up these national republics based on ethnicities like Ukraine, like the Baltic states, etc., which he says is the root of the problem between Russia and the peoples that should be under Russian domination like Ukraine. Wow. So to put it another way, he wants to reverse the mistakes of the creation of the Soviet Union and revert to the Russian empire where wow. there is no such thing as Ukraine and it is directly wow. governed from Moscow. And all of these other ideas that he is embodying in terms of driving Russian foreign and domestic policy. Yes, they look familiar from Soviet times, but actually they too have much deeper roots. He's dragging Russia back to its history from centuries ago and not decades ago. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, I just, what, uh, there were a few really interesting data points, right, in your book, which were um, Putin uh, wearing USSR um, for hockey games, right? Um, things like the Soviet anthem, yeah, I, I guess the, the it seems like he's he's trying to normalize the the idea of the Soviet Union so that he can go back uh, before it, right? You know, that's absolutely right. Yes, he can pick and choose from history the bits which actually suit the narrative that he's putting together. So you see right. Russia tapping into the the Soviet mythology of the Second World War, for example, to legitimize right. what they're doing now, while suppressing all of the inconvenient bits like being in league with Nazi Germany to carve up Europe in, in 1940. Uh, also picking and choosing the bits from, um, from prehistory as well. So calling on all of those parts of Russia's history, most of them actually fictitious, that actually support what he's doing at the moment. Wow. High five. Um, so with regards to that, I, I, I almost think it behooves the world to remind Putin that, you know, in 1259, the Mongolian Empire, uh, there was no <laughs> Russia. So, I, I yeah, that's kind of, I feel, unfortunately, that's where we're going. 
Uh, he is causing this showdown globally uh, that's not going to be good. Um, and that worries me. But I have another question. You talk about the traditions of old Russia. And one of the things we've found as we've been examining the people who are part of the Russian network, uh, this is something that just came out in foreign policy. And I'd, I'd like your take on it. Because one of the things we talk about is Russian cosmism, and we talk about transhumanism, etc. And then this comes out. Is this hocus pocus or is this real? It's hocus pocus, which is a real influence on Russia. Ooh, wow! And this too is this too is nothing new. It does go back to. Um, to previous periods in Russian history when there's been great turmoil and yeah. upheaval and certainties mm -hmm. are removed. And in fact, I, I think it's, uh, it's either in the, the current book or the previous one. I talked about the period um, after the end of communism in the USSR and the early 1990s, where there was this sudden move by mass, massive quantities of Russians into spiritualism. There was the extra sense craze. There was looking for other sources of belief and sources of faith, and some of them extremely bizarre, that actually swept the country during that period. Now, that taps into a deep-rooted tradition again. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It's something that's always latent below the surface. But what we see in the article that you just show is the way in which this hangs over and actually... Uh, exerts influence on on government and on policy and on thinking because some of these wacky ideas about how you can not only plan and predict the entirety of societal processes, every single data input from every source you can bring together to have a complete understanding of how societies work wow. and how it works, but also if you reach in with a sufficiently long screwdriver, you can adapt that to change the world by actually reaching into these these semi-mystical understandings of how things are all interrelated. It, there are some very strange ideas in this pseudoscience that actually is, is pretty mainstream in Russia. But again, the thing is, this is not a new invention. It goes yeah. back to way. It also was very interesting when I was reading Massey's book on Nicholas and Alexandra and looking at Rasputin's impacts on her. And she was just, she was really looking for magical thinking because she was so worried about her child and uh, you know, enter Rasputin, and the rest, of course, is uh, some really pretty brutal history. I would but, love very yes, yeah, Jim. I, I just wanted on the on the mysticism uh, point before we move on from that. Um, Dugan in the '90s obviously was uh, uh, very active um, and promoting a lot of a lot of those mystical ideas, and and started the National Bolshevik Party. Um, uh, which has metastasized into the Nazbols in America and lots of other places. Uh, I, I just wanted to get uh, uh, your brief thoughts on on Dugin and how his influence influences things like the Russian government believing that there are psychic powers and ESP and all of that, you know, bullshit, right? <laughs> um, it, it goes obviously way back before Dugin, um, but because he's become so prevalent, I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on his influence. Yeah, of course, Russia isn't the only society where people promising magical solutions to, to everybody's problems when they're desperate and also identifying somebody to blame don't right. have a ready market. We see that around the world. After all, it's exactly the same principle that the QAnon is founded on. Mm -hmm. But Respect. in the case of Dugan specifically, uh, he's a lot more prominent in foreign writing about Russia than he is within Russia itself. Mm -hmm. And yes, he has written a lot of this stuff down in a way that other people haven't. But I think just like Putin, he is a product of an underlying belief system rather than somebody that is actually creating it for, its, for itself and driving it forward. So if this stuff wasn't widely accepted in the first place, Dugin would not be so popular. And if uh, the, the foreign policy and domestic policy drivers that Putin follows weren't already so well established in Russian politics, and then there's no way he would be able to, to impose them as they are now and have them so widely accepted. Yes. Okay. I just want to get to... No, no, no. That's all so important. I mean, I'm already looking at the time. I'm so nervous because this is flying by so fast, and this is always the part where I beg you to come back so we can keep talking about things that we weren't able to discuss first round. But 
one of the, I, I highlighted so much of the book, but there is a, a quote here from a long-term observer of Russia that Russia's national strategy under Putin is based on behaving so badly that others don't seem to know how to react. To me, that is our problem. The, the bad behavior, the poisonings, the defenestrations, which you mentioned are so 600 years ago, all of it, we do not know how to react. That is not, we've always had corruption with a small C. Enter Trump and it's a, it's a big C now. And, and you know, what are, what are we missing? It seems like we are continually missing the plot and the opportunities to deal with Putin you know, as as this bad behavior occurs. That's exactly right. It is a fundamental problem that has hamstrung Western policy towards Russia throughout. The idea that it can't possibly be true that this is a country that behaves as a rogue state, but also has this 19th century view of how countries interact and how they treat their own population, that it's brought forward into the 21st century. There is not that suspension of disbelief that has always been absolutely essential to deal with Russia as it is, as opposed to continually being optimistic and thinking, well, they can't be that bad, really. And they surely know. Russia and the West must want the same thing. We must. They must want to get along at some level, at some stage. Now, there was another um, comment in the, the book about the behaviors of a lot of the Western politicians trying to force the, the relationship on Russia that Russia is not interested in because they grew up in a, a Western liberal democratic tradition and have had their education in a particular, a very different way of countries doing business with each other and cannot accept and understand that that is not what Russia sees the world, uh, it's how Russia sees the world working and indeed not how, not how Russia wants to see the world working. But they try to force this different kind of relationship and continue to, continue to chase and to pester Russia. And I, I can't remember who said it in the book, but it's, uh, it was pointed out that if Russia were a woman and these men at the heads of state were behaving in this way, they'd be called stalkers. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I will never forget what you said about Macron because immediately when you saw him trying to cozy up, you're like, you're like they all all these leaders always come with this optimism, like I'm going to be the one that is <laughs> able to get us a, a good relationship with Russia, and it never works every single time. And and you point out continually, we do not have the same ambitions. We are engaged in a challenge over the way the world works. Exactly right. Yes. Uh, and until that is recognized, there is never going to be a functional relationship with Russia because it is always going to be based on a fiction. One of, one of the things that um, I think gets in the way is that people, the, the influence that um, the Russians have over people is complex, right? It's not as simple as, oh, I'm sending you a bunch of rubles and, you know, now you're going to do what you want. You, you use the mice um, uh, acronym in, in the book, and I, I use it as well. I, want, I just wanted to briefly hear your thoughts on how these different ways of influencing people come out um, in the world um, and, and why that makes it very complicated to kind of dis distinguish between authentic voices and not. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's difficult to distinguish between authentic and inauthentic voices because sometimes the people who are working on behalf of Russia are actually using their authentic voice. It is complicated. I mean, you have all of these different gradations of why somebody is working against their own country on behalf of Russia or any other foreign power based on a lot of different motivations. And one of the biggest dividers is whether they are consciously furthering Russian interest, whether it's uh, paid or unpaid, by attacking their own society, or whether they think that they are doing it out of their own convictions because they've reached their own conclusions about how the world works and think that, uh, that their own society is wrong. But even within those two categories, you've got so many different facets and so many different reasons why people seek to harm the, the society that they grow up in by furthering Russian interests. And the, the pattern, unfortunately, that seems to underlie a lot of the, the most enthusiastic Russian propagandists is that they have 
been dealing with severely damaged personalities and personal failure for most of their lives. In fact, the overlap between the number of Russian propagandists who uh, also turn out to be convicted sex offenders is absolutely startling. There are yeah. some deep-seated fund first fundamental personality flaws that actually predispose people to being uh, available to be made use of by Russia. And if you look back at the, the KGB handbooks for recruiting agents of influence, agents of subversion, or indeed propagandists, then you can see very clearly that Russia understood the misfits make the good targets, the people with a grudge, the people who feel they've been treated unfairly by the world because they've been consistent failures, and therefore seek revenge. And you can see that revenge coming through so strongly in some of the the verbal attacks that you hear from the trolls, from the so-called independent journalists, the ones pushing the Russian propaganda lines, because the bile and the vitriol and the hatred that they pour out when they're talking about people who criticize Russia, it's extremely personal and it's plainly deep tapping deeply into their own personality defects. Wow. It, it, I, I find it I find it very interesting you say that because I was Joe Normal American before uh well it was the Kyle Rittenhouse shooting that, that caused me to become what I am today. But the people I found in the network behind that fundraiser, every single one of them either had a drug problem or some sort of credible accusation of sexual assault, sexual predator. And I'm talking about billionaires in my country who are shaping politics and media. Mm. Oof, you scare me, but I like that. Okay, that's good. Um, here's, <laughs> here's my question. Here's my question. You talk about, in your book, you talk about... Uh, you know, Russia's shiny new military, all their brand new, you know, stuff on parade in Red Square. Here's my problem with that, though. I look at Ukraine and Russia's getting their butt kicked. Mm -hmm. Where's all this shiny new hardware? What's going on? What? Help me out. Well, there are two very distinct things going on there. First of all, the shiny new stuff and those well-equipped, well-uniformed soldiers that uh, that I saw in Red Square, as I described in the book, they were the ones that were eliminated in the very early stages of this misguided campaign. They were the, the crust of modernity on the Russian armed forces that was peeled very, very quickly when they were thrown into this, this campaign that was completely wrongly designed and foisted on the military as a surprise. So that has disappeared. And what we've got underneath that cross now is once again, this, this seething cesspit of corruption and, and misery that has been the Russian military over the long term. And once again, drafting people, throwing bodies in to absorb as many bullets as possible, as opposed to fighting cleverly, which is what Russia thought it was going to do, but then was ordered to do something totally different when moving into Ukraine. So one shiny new part of the Russian military has gone probably forever, certainly for, uh, for a very long time, but that's not the only thing they were spending money on. And unfortunately, the other programs that, uh, that were really uh, the focus of Russia's attention for a long time when they were doing this military reorganization and re-equipment, uh, some of them haven't even yet come into play. There were the long-range missiles. They were the precision-guided weapons that Russia spent a lot of money on and has now largely expended in Ukraine as well because once Russia realized it couldn't win on the battlefield, it fell back on the tactics it used in, in Syria before now, triggering humanitarian catastrophes by targeting critical civilian infrastructure in order to try to force the, the civilian population to submit. Now, Russia is scraping the barrel with that now, but there are other capabilities we haven't seen in play some of which Russia is still holding back for the big war. We haven't seen any use, for example, of Russia's nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction in this conflict because Russia is keeping them under wraps because it knows it needs them for a bigger confrontation with the West and with the United States. So I got a few questions. Go ahead, Jim, you have something. There's three things I want to make sure we get to before uh, we lose him, but go ahead. I, I just, I, I need to say something real fast. You just said the big war. Russia's planning for World War III, aren't they? 
Of course, they have been for a very long time. In fact, they've been under the impression that they've been at war with yeah. the West for over a decade. This has been an yeah. absolutely constant refrain in Russian domestic media, but they know that they can't go to war overtly. And that's where all of these covert yes. subthreshold, gray zone, so-called hybrid attacks that I'm talking about in the book come in because that is how Russia has been reaching out to harm us short of actually going to military conflict. And I'm so glad you say that because Hi-Fi has taught me that uh, information warfare is war. And I love how you have the refrain that you that you co up the Trotsky line. You might not be interested in Russia, but Russia is interested in you. I thought that was like a brilliant framework for your book. Um, we have a very good friend, Zarina Zabriskie, who is doing uh, boots on the ground reporting from Ukraine. And she just wrote an incredible piece that we discussed earlier in Byline Supplement. But she talks about how a KGB officer came to power and how his propagandist tube fed the population brainwashing sludge for the past two decades financed by oil dollars. And again, like, you know, what we battle here is this tube feeding that's happening in America and we have no armor against it. We, 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 you know, I'm starting to get calls from normies that are starting to see what's going on, but we have not had any armor against the weapons grade tube feeding sludge that has been brainwashing people. What do you recommend? Again, it comes down to national responses and okay. each country around the world has its own particular handicaps in dealing with that specific problem with information warfare. Now, in the United States, it's that deeply uh, embedded view that the, the constitutional amendments safeguarding freedom of speech mean that you can allow a hostile power to exploit it in order to damage your society. That is the, the biggest problem that the United States is facing. There are other problems around the world, like UK lack of legislation I mentioned, Canada societal norms, even without a constitution, meaning that you cannot, under any circumstances, have the government telling people what they should think. Uh, there are so many different challenges that each individual country needs a specific approach. And in the case of the United States, it is hard to know what to suggest because short of, again, recognition at the very senior level of the problem and admitting what the problem is and pointing to those ways in which Russia is delivering this hostile information into US society and the consequences of it, nothing is ever actually going to change. Okay. The problem is, uh, in a way, this is not a, a media issue, it's a counterintelligence issue, because the only thing that is going to make a difference is establishing those connections that actually lead these main, these major voices in the US media space to parrot Russian disinformation. And that is not something which is going to be possible to establish from open sources unless they are very careless or somebody is very lucky. The problem is it needs the political will to actually recognize this as a challenge and start digging in places where members of the public like you and me cannot. And that's not just the United States, it's, it's across the world where people are working on behalf of Russia, whether it's in the media, whether it's hack and leak operations, whether it's the agents of influence who do their work covertly and are dripping the Russian messages into the ears of decision makers directly in closed meetings. All of those things are beyond our powers to investigate. All of them require an actual counterintelligence investigation looking at sources which are not open to the public, but that in turn requires the will to actually start that process. So President Biden, wow. if you're listening. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's, that's basically he, what we need. We just got our marching orders. I have two more questions. Please stay with us. Um, let me just get my questions out and then you guys wrap it up. Um, what I love about your book is that you go into anecdotes and stories that we don't already know. We already know about the poisonings and many of the defenestrations. Can you give our viewers one example from your book that is not well known that really embodies uh, what our, our battle is? 
That is so hard to choose from because the point of the book was was making the point that below all of the stories that make the headlines, there are dozens and dozens of more that never do. And that's why I interviewed so many people around the world who've uh, put themselves either at risk deliberately of Russia by opposing Russia, or it came as a complete surprise to them because they had no interest in Russia before Russia hit them hard. So if you pick any one of these stories from only one of these different domains, you'll get a very different picture from what it means means to actually be at risk from Russia. Let me just take one that um, I think has surprised uh, a few people uh, around the world, and that is the, the ransomware problem, which is uh, well known in the United States, of course, just like it is in the UK. And the way in which that actually dips into everybody's pocket and funnels the cash to Moscow because the costs of these campaigns are borne by ordinary citizens, whether it's spread out through cyber insurance, whether it comes out of your tax dollars, and it all goes straight to Russia and straight to criminal gangs that share a headquarters with the Ministry of Digital Communications in Moscow. Wow. So this is why I say nobody's too unimportant to be a target, and it's Russia's war on everybody, because everybody is affected by these Russian campaigns. Wow, thank you for that. My last question for you before I turn it over to the guys is what is it about your background and your passion that makes you want to do this work? This is not easy work. It's not comfortable. We know we're dealing with the mafia state. Why do you do it? Because I dislike what they do, and I would rather they stopped. Uh, one of the New Year messages I got just a few days ago was <laughs> from a, a long-term colleague who recalled a conversation we had a decade ago when nobody was particularly interested in Russia. In fact, this was about the time when uh, we used to work for the UK Ministry of Defense, but then we were hoofed out into the private sector because Russia wasn't actually that important at the time. And he had asked me what exactly the same question. What is it that drives you to study Russia and warn about Ru Russia? is planning and he said to me this year now i finally see what it was all about but that yeah. is part of the problem it takes a decade and it takes russia doing something sufficiently egregious that nobody can really argue that we have a problem anymore yeah like how more egregious could this war be and yet we have these you know uh russian simps out there some of them tech billionaires trying to negotiate policy on behalf of them it's it's, it's terrible what's happening to the inability to have a shared narrative in America, but it's why we're in this fight. Hi-Fi Jim, final questions? Just, just uh, in the United States, uh, with Donald Trump uh, said all the time, Russia, 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 right? To, to sort of instill this, this fatigue and, and uh, you know, um, a resistance against anybody mentioning the word Russia, right? I, I, on Twitter, when I started this work, the minute I started mentioning Russian connections to QAnon and all these other disinformation campaigns, uh, it wasn't the MAGA people. It wasn't the people on the right that surprised me. It was the people on the left. It was the people that were supposed to be uh, you know, pro-America and, and you know, against Nazis and all of that. But as soon as you mention Russia, suddenly you're a conspiracy theorist. Suddenly you're some kind of crazy person. And I noticed in, in your book there, you know, that is an accusation that often um, gets put out there. That person's crazy. What do you mean Russian interference? I just wanted to... to does that does, does that uh what's the antidote to that russia 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 does that, or, or also does that match up to your impression? yes 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 Yes, yes, yes. It's a highly successful propaganda campaign. And again, not just Trump, but Trump is building on foundations that have gone back a long way because for so long, the Russia was not recognized as the problem. And people like me who were saying, actually, no, we do have a problem and it's going to bite us very hard in the tender parts before long. Uh, <laughs> we were the cranks. We were the, the conspiracy theorists who were yeah. seeing reds under the bed where there were none. And that <laughs> Pre presents a very deep-seated attitude against which you have to push back. But that's the reason why the book, the, the latest book, is dedicated to Vladimir Putin, because he's done more for us than anybody has in proving that actually, yes, the world Bingo. really does have a Russia yeah. problem. Bingo. Thank you so much. Great question and great response. High five. Final, uh, final question. <clears throat> final question. As I was reading uh -oh. about Russia... 
and understanding cosmism and understanding that one of the basic tenets of cosmism is that Russia will bring a new age of understanding to the world. One of the things I found as I was going through, you know, my, my Russian education was this, and this kind of freaks me out. And I I don't want to get into conspiracy theories around diseases, but I found this. Russia talks a lot. Mike Flynn talks a lot about bioweapons laboratories. I don't like BS. I like hard data. So the only things I found were this report and this academic paper. Is it within the realm of possibility that Russia would unleash biological weapons upon the planet? And, and, and the reason I ask this is because Vladimir Putin seems to have a beyond reasonable terror of the COVID virus, as evidenced by his giant tables. You know, the fact he was just at an Orthodox Christmas, uh, you know, two days ago, and he was the only person in the church. He seems terrified. I don't understand that. I think those could be three completely unrelated things. And certainly messianism in in Russia's view of itself in the world, again, is something that goes back a long way. And it's one of the compensation mechanisms for Russians who realize the, the deep and insoluble misery of their own existence. And so look for something which is beyond the physical and look for, for spiritual means of compensation for that. And this idea that in some way Russia must be better than the rest of the world because in all of the physically palpable ways it is worse is something that drives a lot of these ideas of, of Russia as the third Rome, as Russia as a, a center of, uh, of post-Western liberal philosophy about the world. And then you have, would Russia be willing to unleash biological weapons on the world? Of course it would, because Russia does not, has no qualms about the ways in which it wants to harm the rest of the world and the weapons of mass destruction that it wants to develop. Does that necessarily mean uh, that, it, is it the reason why Putin is so terrified of coronavirus? Not necessarily, because whatever the, the version of Putin's health problems you believe, most of them lead you to the conclusion that his immune system is likely to be weaker than you would expect a normal, healthy individual of his age to be. So it makes sense for him, just like anybody else with, with compromised health, to shelter themselves as far as possible from coronavirus. Now, all of those three things, of course, together, you can bring them together into a coherent picture of what's going on, but that doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that they are part of the same grand scheme it's like we can ask you anything i mean yeah it, well what, regardless they the the propaganda is uh uh that there are biolabs right they regardless of the actual or, origin and whether they've unleashed bi biological weapons informationally right if that's a word they've been uh pushing this narrative um that it's it's not Russia uh, with bio labs. It's the West with bio labs, and they're in Ukraine, and that's why we have to, you know, denazify it and, and get yeah. rid of all the biological weapons. So, you know, I, I I think I just wanted to 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 say, regardless of the origin of the actual disease, the Russians are expert at weaponizing it against other nations and disarming them right? Uh, in terms of anti-vax, as you mentioned before. Yeah. I love, I, when you come back, I would like, I'd love how you say that the enlightenment passed Russia by. I think that's a really critical point, but, but I'd like to always end it with like action steps, you know, ways that people can get out of despair and knowing that there is a solution. And you told me a long time ago that we may never be able to get on the same page with this rogue state, but there have been ways to mitigate the damage and have a, a uh, if not a relationship, at least some sort of understanding. And, you know, in the, in the end, you're like, what can we do? Can, you know, along with getting leaders to admit that we are at, you know, the target of information warfare, what else can we do in order to dial down the, uh, the pain? 
Well, one of those points we've already mentioned, we talked about uh, suspending disbelief in order to accept the nature of Russia and what they want to do, because once you accept it, it becomes possible to deal with it in a way that simply isn't possible if you still believe your own hubris that you're going to fix the Russian relationship and still believe your own optimism that somehow yes. or other we must all end up on the same page at some point. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect uh, I actually wrote about in 2021, a paper that came out through Chatham House in September of that year called What Deters Russia? And again, it was a look back through Soviet and pre-Soviet history to the consistent patterns of how you can dissuade Russia from doing something irresponsible or dangerous or just plain stupid, like, for example, invading Ukraine. It looked at all of the different case studies of where attempts to do that have worked and where they failed and drew out the themes that actually seem to lead to success. Now, unfortunately, of course, nobody actually read that. And uh, six <laughs> months later, they invaded Ukraine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just again your your you know your humor and self-deprecation always uh always uh comes through and I appreciate you so much. I appreciate the work so much. Yes, please next time let's talk about Russia never experiencing the enlightenment or the reformation because I feel like we are still living in the shadow of their dark ages. Um okay, everybody uh yes, hi fi I just just to clarify, I, I have a common complaint when I try to explain this to people or to tell them, you know, this is what they're doing. Here's how you counteract it. And that complaint is nobody fucking listens. Is that <laughs> your complaint as well? If they listen, like, I, I wouldn't be saying the same things today that I was saying 20 years ago. Uh, yeah. Whenever anybody asks, what do we do about it? It's a case of pulling something off the shelf, blowing the dust off because it's all <laughs> so many times before. Oh, Kier, I'm so happy that you're here with us. Um, I do want to say that uh, we do have very uh, passionate, literate uh, viewers who are readers. Please do go out and buy uh, Kier Giles' The War on Everybody, uh, Russia's War on Everybody. It is available on Amazon right now, hardcover in a couple of weeks. Um, people, can, people can buy the uh, ebook version now, though, right? That's right, yes. Okay. 26 of January released in North America, US, and Canada, uh, but ebook already available now. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. We have been uh, very, very hyper focused on this, and you have shed a lot of light on uh, what's actually happening and what people can do. And I think the first step is to pressure leaders to acknowledge that we are the target nation of a type of warfare that is disrupting everything um, that we have that we have known. So thank you so much, Kier. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Fantastic interview. Thank you. I am so glad you guys got to meet Kier Giles. I've been talking about him for years and he did not disappoint. What an incredible interview. All right. Uh, absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, one of one of the people who who makes me feel saner, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. because he he he, ex which is you know, I need. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, so I know. That was fantastic. He's he's amazing. When we um, when we talk about and a great speaker, he is he, he's yeah amazing. When we talk about reality and reality is perception, you know, one of the issues we see is that we see reality a very specific way because of what is happening and the the data we have yeah and and they're pushing back against this reality no 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 that's not reality you're crazy you're a conspiracy mm -hmm. theorist mm -hmm. and when someone like here comes along and says no actually they're correct mm -hmm. that kind of helps reestablish our reality and now uh, you know what helpful. My feeling has always been one person at a time and we're going to push on. Yeah, they're going to say Russia, Russia, Russia. But I love your response. I find yes, yes, yes. And I love how Kira's is like, yeah, you know, and then I pull something off the shelf and just blow the dust off and go, here it is. I mean, that was just so genius. Um, Brilliant. So speaking of reality, I would like to uh, hit play on a video from a reporter from Norway who captured a very human interaction in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. I cannot see this video enough. Fucking treasonous pieces of shit! <laughs> <laughs> 